Erosion and weathering do an excellent job at stripping away the fine details of stone carvings and reshaping geologic landmarks. However, these processes take a very long time to occur under normal conditions, and also occur in a very uniform pattern, generally speaking. For example, the most common building material of ancient structures, limestone, only dissolves by 1 20th of a centimeter, or in other terms half of a millimeter, every 100 years, due to processes such as rainfall and wind abrasion. These conditions alone simply do not explain the severe damage that can be observed on most ancient constructions. Archaeologists claim, for instance, that limestone structures, such as the Temple of Kukulkan in Mexico, are around 12 to 1300 years old. 1,300 years after the pyramid's construction, the uniform weathering would have worn away only 6.5 millimeters of the surface layer. If you look at the structure, you'll notice some inconsistencies with this logic. On the southwest side of the Temple of Kukulkan, there's far more damage than on the rest of the structure. This damage is much deeper than 6.5 millimeters. Wind abrasion cannot account for the non-uniform damage. The Coriolis effect generally causes the wind to blow from the northeast at this location. If wind had carried small particles of dirt and other debris, and deposited it onto the structure over centuries, rather than, for example, the structure having been buried by a catastrophe, then the majority of the dirt layer would be present on the northeastern side of the pyramid, instead of the southwestern side. There's many other ancient pyramids throughout Mesoamerica which display similar signs of damage. In Veracruz, Mexico, there's many pyramids at the site of the ruins of El Tajin, which are even more damaged than the Temple of Kukulkan. The pyramids of El Tajin were not only buried, but they were also apparently impacted in such a way that left the structures lopsided and crumbling. The condition of the El Tajin pyramids indicates a cause of destruction more forceful than weathering, and the immense burial rules out earthquakes and erosion as the only causes of damage. There are scattered boulders around the pyramid as well, which appear to have been deposited by the same force which caused the pyramids to become buried. The pyramids at the site of Tikal in Guatemala, as well as the Teotihuacan complex in Mexico, also bear visibly similar damage to the El Tajin pyramids and the Temple of Kukulkan, and were each also buried upon their rediscovery. The Great Sphinx of Giza has been the topic of many debates regarding the damage present on the ancient structure. As observed by the well-known professor and author, Dr. Robert Schock, the walls surrounding the Great Sphinx show clear signs of erosion due to, quote, prolonged and extensive rainfall. The statue is also discovered buried to its head in sand. Most people are not aware that the Sphinx itself was reconstructed. The right side of the Sphinx's face and headdress were much more damaged than the left side. It's also unknown what had broken off the nose of the Sphinx, and when. There's a myth that Napoleon's army had shot the nose off with a cannon when they visited Egypt in 1798. However, there's older depictions of the Sphinx statue, which show it not having a nose, well before Napoleon's army had visited Egypt. Dr. Schock's theory of water erosion damaging the Sphinx likely carries some weight to it, despite the backlash it's received. The neighboring pyramids also display signs of water erosion. An outer layer of polished white limestone was once present on each of the pyramids. Only the Great Pyramid of Khafre still retains a noticeable portion of its outer layer, mostly near the top of the pyramid, which is also the highest point of any of the structures in Egypt. A 14-foot layer of silt containing marine fossils was also discovered surrounding the pyramids. Tidal forces carrying and depositing oceanic sediment is the only cause of this type of silt deposition. An archaeologist named Sharik El Morsi had also discovered that a pristine fossil of a sea urchin was present on a limestone block which had been knocked off of one of the Great Pyramids in the past, and now buried in sand. The condition of the fossil, and the visible perforations of the exoskeleton, El Morsi explains, reveals that the fossil had been preserved relatively recently and was not present inside of the limestone block at the time of the limestone's initial formation. Even today, you can observe that many broken blocks of limestone have been scattered around the pyramids as if they had been blown off the structures. The same observation extends out to other structures far from the Giza pyramids as well, demonstrating that the destruction of the pyramids is not localized to the location of the Great Pyramids of Giza. Many modern historians claim that the outer layer of polished limestone blocks that had been on the Giza pyramids are missing because people had stripped away these blocks to use to build other structures. Structural engineers have observed, however, that there's no evidence of indentations for scaffolding, which would be required to strip the blocks higher than a few feet from the base of the pyramids. 
There's also no evidence of cutting, which would be necessary to remove the outer layer. According to a structural engineer named Peter James, the damage present on the Great Pyramids appears to be more from a great force which swept over the pyramids and knocked off most of the outer layer. Furthermore, an inch-thick layer of salt was discovered on the inside of the pyramids, coating the inner limestone. The mineral composition of the salt can only be found in salt water. The presence of a thick salt layer inside of the pyramids indicates that a large quantity of salt water had flooded into the pyramids through the openings on the sides of the structures, and that as the water inside of the pyramids eventually dried up, it left a thick layer of salt behind. This indicates that instead, there was a large flood containing salt water that caused the pyramids to become submerged and flooded their interiors. Any layer of salt that would have been deposited on the outside of the pyramids and the Great Sphinx would have eroded away over time due to wind erosion, as well as rainfall which would wash away the salt layer covering these structures. Rain and wind are unable to enter the pyramids in significant enough quantities to erode away layers of salt inside of the pyramids. The signs of water erosion on these structures, which seems to be the cause of the outer layers having been loosened and removed, combined with the fact that this damage only reaches up to a certain height on these structures, indicates that major flooding had occurred at this site in the past. The directional nature of the damage on these structures also suggests that this flooding may have approached from a specific direction, such as how a tidal wave does, versus the flooding being caused by only rainfall accumulation. If an initial tidal force that was not as high as the top of the Pyramid of Khafre had impacted these structures, then this would explain why the top portion of this pyramid was not damaged as much. Any further flooding accumulation reaching the top of this pyramid eventually would not have caused as much damage as the initial force of the incoming water. The smaller surface area of the top of the pyramid would also have reduced the impact force of the flowing water. There's ample concrete evidence to indicate that the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx of Giza have been submerged in the past. The same types of damage can be observed on many other ancient structures worldwide. The temple complex of Hampi, India is believed to have been constructed in the 600s AD, which would make it approximately 1,400 years old. Physical evidence indicates that the temples and the surrounding constructions are even older than this. Many sections of these temples have been broken and scattered about. This is not simply due to the blocks falling off the structure over time due to general weathering and structural failure. The stones lie around erratically, as if they've been smashed off the temple. While this factor alone could be explained by the battles that took place at the site centuries ago, there is evidence that much of the damage to these structures was not caused by these wars. Many of the building fragments are embedded quite deeply in the ground. Battles do not explain the buried nature of these ruins. More evidence of inexplicable burial can be observed at the tops of the temples, where very thick layers of soil are present for no apparent reason. There is no evidence of people having placed soil on top of these structures at any point in time. Furthermore, many of these structures are assembled very poorly compared to other sections of the same temple complex. It strongly appears that an event which destroyed and buried portions of the site had occurred in the past, and attempts were made to reconstruct the site after the damage. The distinctly inferior style of the reconstruction indicates that those who had rebuilt portions of the site after this possible catastrophic event were less capable of construction for some reason than those who had constructed the temples originally. Even though the people who had attempted to reconstruct the temples already had the building materials present since they were scattered around the site, this is notable because modern historians believe that civilizations generally become more advanced as time progresses. These factors indicate that the original constructors of these temples were more capable of reconstruction than those who had attempted to reconstruct the site after it was damaged. The walls of the temples and the surrounding statues display irregular damage, with large sections having been broken off. As with the Great Pyramids and Sphinx in Egypt, as well as the Temple of Kukulkan in Mexico discussed previously, there's evidence of a strong directional force having impacted the Hampi Temple complex. The Hamakuda Hill Temple is a prominent example of this. The right side of this temple is pristine, the roof is clear, and the foundation is solid. The left side of this temple, on the other hand, is in significant disrepair. The foundation is broken apart, the pillars are more worn, and the roof is topped with broken apart stones and soil, which has sprouted vegetation. If the cause of damage was due to factors such as earthquakes or attacks from Muslim invaders during the 1565 Battle of Talikota, 
then the right portion of the structure would also show signs of damage. If instead, however, a tsunami-like force had impacted the site from the left side, then the left side of the temple would have taken the brunt of the damage, protecting the right side of the temple from the same damage. This would certainly explain the inconsistent yet severe damage inflicted upon the structure. This directional force is the same reason as to why some sections of Hampia are still in very good condition. If a large tidal force coming from a specific direction had swept across the Hampi Temple complex in the past, then some portions of the site would have taken the brunt of the damage, protecting other sections of the temple complex from receiving the same amount of damage. Other sections of the Hampi Temple site display even odder features. If you observe the gazebo-like structures, you'll see that they each have a foundation to rest on. In this image, the gazebo in the background is on top of a well-constructed foundation composed of stones that fit together properly, while the gazebo itself sits perfectly upright. There are other gazebos in the background without roofs that also sit upon the well-made foundation. The gazebo in the foreground, however, is resting upon a very ramshackled foundation and lopsided. It appears almost as if people had found this site partially strewn apart, and they had attempted to reconstruct the gazebo in the foreground, but due to a lack of skill, resources, or some other reason, they reassemble the gazebo in a very haphazard way. The lack of tops on many of the background gazebos also indicates that something had possibly knocked the tops off. More evidence indicating a catastrophe of some sort can be observed in the large number of gigantic boulders scattered around the site. The boulders clearly caused some damage to the structures, as you can see many spots where boulders and parts of the building had fallen together. The majority of the buildings at the Hamby complex appear to have been reconstructed. Sections of these buildings still lie scattered and broken apart from when the structures were destroyed. The structures that exist now appear to have been rebuilt poorly from the remains of the damaged buildings, explaining why some stones don't fit together as well in some buildings as in the less damaged structures. The builders of the Hampi Temple complex would not have taken the time to create such elaborate and well-made structures and carvings, and yet have also created these very poorly constructed portions of the site. This is an indication that different builders were responsible for the construction of the well-made portions of the temple complex. The more poorly built sections of the complex are present due to reconstruction at a later date by less capable builders, who had used the rubble of the destroyed structures in an attempt to rebuild the portions of the complex that had been damaged long ago. Other buildings at Hampi contain facades of smaller stones stacked during attempts to rebuild the damaged temples. Behind the facade, you can clearly see the original blocks, which were much larger and cut to fit together well. When archaeologists claim that the Hampi temples were built around 600 AD, they're actually referring to the reconstruction of this site. It's comparable to a child finding an already built Lego building, smashing the building apart, and reconstructing it. The reconstructed building was made later than the original, but the new building was made from the original. The Indians reconstructed the Hampi Temple site around 600 AD, but the evidence indicates that the original structures are far older. The Angkor complex in Cambodia was also damaged by more than just weathering. Many sections of the ruins are jostled, broken, and strewn about. It almost appears as if a large earthquake had damaged the site. However, Cambodia is a virtually earthquake-free area, seeing only as much tectonic activity as regions such as Norway, Eastern Russia, or Central Canada. Although Cambodia is not known for experiencing earthquakes nowadays, if at some point in the past an event had occurred which caused all the continents to split apart drastically, this would cause massive earthquakes to occur at locations across the world, even at locations which normally do not experience major earthquakes. This would account for why the Angkor complex shows signs of having been through a major earthquake in the past. Another site which had seen catastrophic damage in the past is Machu Picchu in Peru. The ruins of the complex were rediscovered in 1911. The appearance of Machu Picchu today is not the way it looked in 1911. It took decades for Machu Picchu to be excavated and reconstructed because there was so much damage. Again, weathering does not cause damage to this magnitude. Some might claim that earthquakes are the primary cause of damage to the site. Earthquakes do not explain the thick layer of soil that Machu Picchu was buried under when it was rediscovered in 1911, though. Pumapunku is a similar location in Tiwanaku, Bolivia, where the remains of ancient structures have been discovered tossed around catastrophically and buried. What had once been buildings are now nothing more than scattered shards. Excavation of the site revealed that significant portions of the buildings were buried, 
As with Machu Picchu, Pumapunku's destruction cannot be explained solely by tectonic activity, since so much burial took place. These large structures were found to extend several feet into the ground upon excavation of the site. Clearly, there is many more portions of these structures buried and in need of complete exposure. The excavations of this site had been suddenly halted years ago, however, for an unrevealed reason. Whomever had ordered for the excavation and restoration of Pumapunku to be halted clearly did not want anything else that has been buried to be rediscovered. The devastation and burial of the structures at the site of Pumapunku demonstrates that the mainstream narrative about the history of this site cannot be correct. The destruction of this site surpasses the effects of typical natural disasters and weathering. This exact type of damage, being immense burial and impact damage, can be explained, however, by the same causes of damage which seem to have impacted also the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt, the Temples of Hampi in India, the Temple of Kukulkan in Mexico, and innumerable other ancient structures around the world. This cause of damage appears to be a large tidal force which had forcefully swept across the site. The appearance of the wreckage at Pumapunku bears a strong resemblance to when someone knocks down a Lego building, scattering debris all around. It is very clear that an abnormally strong force had demolished Pumapunku. Pumapunku is a prime example of stonework that's so advanced that modern historians are unable to explain how the Inga would have been capable of constructing the site since they only had access to primitive tools. Could it be possible that a more technologically advanced civilization had existed long before the Inca had settled this site, and that this even more advanced civilization had been destroyed along with these structures? This scenario is what the evidence not only at Pumapunku, but at many other ancient ruins around the world, strongly indicates. In Saskatchewan, Canada, there's evidence of an ancient building which had been knocked over and compressed into the ground. When the stone wall collapses, the stones towards the base of the building tend to stay closer to each other, while the stones towards the top of the wall spread apart as they fall. These physics can be clearly observed in the images of what's been termed as the Saskatchewan Mystery Rocks. These rocks were cut to fit together precisely, in the same fashion as elaborate stone walls found at ancient sites across the world. Another interesting feature about the Saskatchewan Mystery Rocks is the size of each stone, which are much larger than typical stones used to construct walls nowadays but are much more similar to the size and cutting style of other ancient megalithic sites around the world. The collapse of this stone wall appears to have been caused by an earthquake. Saskatchewan, as with Cambodia discussed previously, is not known for having major earthquakes nowadays, though. If, however, a worldwide continental shift had occurred in the past, then the entire world would have experienced major earthquakes. The destruction of the stone wall of Saskatchewan appears to have been caused by a massive earthquake which had knocked the wall down, followed by a large tidal force which had swept across the structure and caused portions of it to become buried. Since the Saskatchewan mystery rocks are evidently the remains of a building, then where's the rest of the structure? Given the circumstances of many other ancient structures which were discovered buried under deep layers of soil, it's very likely that there's many other stone blocks under the earth at this location. The only practical cause of this type of damage and burial of structures around the world is devastating tsunamis, as well as earthquakes caused primarily by the rapid shifting of continents. Directional abrasion, combined with the burial of these sites, strongly indicates the interaction of tidal forces on a larger scale than typical floods. Many ancient texts, including the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Satapatha Brahmana of the Vedas, the Zoroastrian Mazdaism, the writings of the Greek poet Epicharmus, the Book of Genesis and the Bible, the Chinese work The Great Flood of Gun Yu, the Mayan Popol Vu, and innumerable other sacred texts around the world provide accounts of a catastrophic flood which had destroyed ancient civilizations. There's actually over 200 ancient texts from around the world which describe a worldwide flood that had occurred in the past. According to most of these narratives, a worldwide flood had occurred approximately 4,000 years ago. If this flood is indeed the cause of much of the damage seen on these structures, then they would have to be at least 4,000 years old. This is certainly contrary to what's believed regarding the age of these ancient structures, and challenges the beliefs of what cultures had really constructed these sites. The physical conditions of these structures indicates that they had been damaged in an unnatural way. An understanding of the forces which typically damage rocks and stonework over the span of centuries and millennia reveals that whatever had destroyed these ancient sites is far more catastrophic than what we were aware of, and had damaged structures around the world in the same ways. 
If there is truth to these accounts of a worldwide flood in the past, then it would explain what had occurred to these ancient structures and why they're so damaged. All of the evidence that we've reviewed so far certainly indicates that a worldwide catastrophe having occurred in the past is at least a possibility.